If you're an entrepreneur, you know what it means to take personal and financial risks, create jobs that support your community, and devote most of your time to your business. But do you know how to plan for a successful exit from your business? Do you know who should be involved in creating your succession or transition plan and the steps along the way? Welcome to Finish Big, the podcast with Mark Dorman from Legacy Business Advisors. The podcast theme is inspired by critically acclaimed business author, Bo Burlingham, author of Finish Big, how great entrepreneurs exit their companies on top. In this podcast, you'll hear success stories of exit plans done right and pick up practical tips based on years of legacy business advisors' expertise and knowledge about the largest and most important financial transaction of your life. Now, on to the show. Good morning. And welcome to the Finish Big Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Dorman. It is a beautiful day here in Northeast Ohio, and I am super excited to welcome my next guest, Mr. Chuck Richards. Chuck has become a good friend. Chuck is the CEO of Value Compass. Chuck, let's just dive right in. Welcome to Finish Big, and thank you for joining us today. I appreciate it, Mark. It's great to be here. Great, great. Well, we've got a lot to lot to cover here in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. So I want to start by giving our, our viewers a sense of, you know, who's Value Compass, how you got started, etc. But before we do, I just want to reaffirm with everyone who's listening that, you know, the purpose of the Finish Big podcast is to really help you, the business owners that are listening, unpack everything that needs to be discussed within a an exit succession and transition plan, the tools that you'll need or you should be looking for, the types of advisors and really thought leadership that you should be striving to obtain. And when I think of that, I think of Chuck Richards and Value Compass. So without further ado, Chuck, give us a little bit of your background and how you got started with Value Compass, please. Sure. Um, so my, my background is growing up in a, a town that had some serious economic issues. So I've always wanted to understand why. And it, it turns out at the end, of it, it's a pretty simple why. It's just, if the businesses in that town are strong and they are growing and they transfer successfully to the next generations, then the community in the local economy will be also be strong. But that's not always the case. So in my little towns was not the case. And so when I went off to college and, and ultimately graduate school at MIT, I wanted to understand why. And the question was real simple. You know, how do you build a valuable business? Because if indeed the business is valuable, it'll transfer, be sold or transferred to the family members. And if not, it will close. And so MIT basically uh, was all, all about understanding the business as an engine. How does the engine work? How do you make it stronger? How do you measure operating performance? So those were the early days I uh, went on from there because my wife wanted to feed the kids, left academia, uh, built a number of businesses, you know, had some that did really, really well. Became, one became the largest pipe company in the world that would be composite spoolable and the other is not so well. But in the process, what we learned the same thing over and over again, that there is a, a best practice for growing a valuable business. Went on there to do consulting for a decade, working in thousands of businesses and doing exactly the same thing as making them valuable, whatever valuable was defined as by the owner. And that's the other lesson we began to learn is the importance of connecting advisors to the process. And that led to creating software and software so that we could duplicate this stuff. And ultimately that software led to Value Compass. And Value Compass is really how do you connect all those dots that Mark talked about to make sure that the owner achieves their goal and that the, the business continues on for multiple generations? Yeah, that's great. That's great background. So Chuck, I, one of the things I really admire about you, and I remember the first time that I met you, is we all know businessmen and women that you know swear they've never had any failures, right? They, they're everything, well, you know, They've just got the quote unquote Midas touch, but you and I both know that behind every great business person uh, or entrepreneur, there are just like coming off the master's weekend here. There's a lot more bad shots sometimes than good shots. And you're quick to say, Hey, I had some really good successes and I had a couple of bumps along the way. Maybe just take us back a little bit. I want to go back to MIT in your education 
what was it about the community you lived in? What was the name of the community? I, I think if I, if I recall, it was about 10,000 residents. And as you've shared with me, it was, it was a couple of businesses that didn't plan properly, didn't have an exit, didn't have a true business continuity plan, however you want to uh, refer to it. And the negative impact to that community was devastating, correct? Yeah, so the, the little town was Springfield, Vermont. And so if you backtrack, as you just said, when I was in elementary school, it was the wealthiest town in Vermont. By the time I went, uh, I graduated from high school, it was the poorest town in Vermont. It literally went from the top to the bottom in about a decade. Wow. And all the bad things you can possibly imagine. We saw a little town of 10,000 people lost 5,000 jobs. And the didn't understand what happened until a decade later, which was, it was actually pretty simple. As Mark just said, the town had three main businesses and underneath those were all the little businesses that were the feeder system. And as long as those main businesses were in good shape, everything hummed along. But those three businesses, which had lasted for, you know, for 50, 60 years, when it came time to transfer them to this generation, that's when they failed. So the failure was not, quote unquote, of the business. The failure was of the transfer. Mm -hmm. And so that ability to transfer a business successfully is the key to communities and it's the key to families. And so, indeed, it was a tragedy for a lot of families that this all occurred. So the question was, became, you know, what do you do about it? And that's really been the just of it. What's the kind of the scary part, if you think about our economy as a whole, there's about an 80% plus failure rate to sell or transfer private businesses. So people work their entire lives. They plan on selling it. They plan on all these things. When it comes down to the end, the vast, vast majority fail to transfer successfully. So that's been the sort of the, the nexus of everything that, that I've been working towards and thinking about. Mm -hmm. The good news let me just pa pause right there. So I want to explore that a little bit further if we could. And our guest today is, is Chuck Richards, uh, CEO and chairman of Value Compass. Value Compass is a business analytical tool, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. But Chuck, I'm just so intrigued by your background here and your passion for this. But 80% failure rate for businesses transitioning one time, right? So that you know, forget the family businesses and shirt sleeves, the shirt sleeves that we all kind of know that. But in, in the number one reason that these businesses fail is lack of planning, correct? Yeah, exactly. And, and you can get much more specific than that. There's really two issues. Mm -hmm. The first issue is that owners don't tend to treat their business like an asset. They treat their house like an asset. They treat their stocks, their bonds could be a commercial building, they treat them like an asset. So they think about them in those terms. Most owners think about their business as cash flow, as, as hip pocket national bank, as we used to say. They don't think about it as an asset or treat it that way. So the number one thing is if business owners could step back and treat their business like an asset. So what does that mean? That's the second part. The most important part is you've got to connect your business plan with your personal plan. So what we found is that if you, even if you treat your business like an asset, there was still a high failure rate. Once we started to make sure that owners saw their business as an asset, measured as an asset, and that's what value compass and our analytics are all about, to measure it as an asset. Then the second part was, okay, now that you have it as an asset, you got to step back and have a conversation with fundamentally an advisor and say, okay, this is my business, this is my business plan. What are my personal objectives? How do they fit together? How do they mesh together? Because if you don't mesh them together, what we found were still high failure rates. But as soon as we were able to get owners to think about the business as an asset, and then think about that asset in their personal plan, how they invest, how they reinvest back into that business, they put it into a longer term planning cycle, both personally for themselves and, and their families and their community, we see a 90 plus percent success rate. We literally go from 80% failure to 90% success by doing those two things. Treat the business like an asset and, and connect your business and your personal planning. And that's Mark's world. That's why I, I have worked with Mark for a long time because that's exactly what he does. It's exactly what owners need. Yeah, I mean, we are, are very fortunate to be in this space. I mean, I'm 
extremely passionate about what I would call the heroes of the American economy, the small business men and women that have risked their own capital, created jobs, not only the jobs that are within the building, but as you mentioned earlier, it's the micro economy that surrounds these businesses. It could be the breakfast joint, the movie theater, the great schools in a community, all the little underlying uh, smaller businesses that help prop up the larger mainstay employers within a community. One of the things that I want to I want to chat with you about is, is is we know the statistics that I believe it's about eighty percent of the jobs in America are created by the small business entrepreneur in the lower end of the middle market. Would you Would you concur with that? Yeah, I, I absolutely. And it, it, that might be a little bit light. Huh. <laughs> yeah, the vast, vast majority of jobs are created by small to medium-sized businesses. Big businesses tend to acquire other businesses, and then they tend to shed jobs. Yeah. So, I mean, when you say, hey, treat your business as an asset, connect your business plan with your personal plan, and the odds of a successful tra uh, transition really skyrocket, I just want to kind of press you on that issue because we know that for a lot of small and what we will refer to as micro businesses, maybe main street businesses under a million dollars of revenue, or could be a lifestyle business. Some of the owner centricity of these businesses will, you know, what kind of uh, lead you down a road where that might not necessarily be, be transferable. And I've seen that in my own practice. However, if I get out in front of that and I recognize that this asset isn't transferable, to your point earlier, then I can work to fix it so that I give it a better chance to transition successfully. And that's really what Value Compass helps us help us helps us to uncover. Correct? Exactly. There are some businesses that that won't transfer and probably shouldn't transfer. And if that's the case, then they become a high paying job. Mm -hmm. And that's where planning comes in. We uh, worked with a, a gentleman once who had this machine about the size of three houses that printed paper chip bags. He made a lot of money, made $2 million. And um, so his, he came to us back where we were consulting, said, I, I really want to grow this thing. I really want to, you know, double in size kind of thing, all excited about growth and looked at the business. And it came down pretty simply that these machines absolutely make a lot of money. But in order to grow, we had to buy a second machine about two airplane rides away. And at that point, he'd make $2 million more on top of the two million he was making. The problem was really simple. His lifestyle would suddenly change from being a gentleman who and his wife, and they do all kinds of fun stuff together, making a couple of million dollars. And he was now going to be on airplanes flying back and forth. He's going to put his more capital at risk. And it just made, didn't make any sense. So mm. my conversation with him was really simple. I said, you love to fish for two months of the year. Do you, you, do you want to give up fishing with your, with your wife and, and, and sit on an airplane? And he looked at me and goes, he goes, not really. I said, I can easily help you grow your business. But is that what you want? Yeah. And he yeah. had a Mark sitting next to him. And, and Mark looked at him and goes, forget his name, call him Bill. Bill, uh, what do you think? And Bill said, no, I don't want to do that. So mm -hmm. what do you do in a case like that? You milk the business to the very, very end. You just keep mm -hmm. running it and running it and running it. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and we had one of our previous guests, Doug Tatum, who is the author of No Man's Land and the chairman of the Newport board group. And he's, he's got a terrific saying that you'll say to a lot of lower uh, business business owners on the lower end of the middle market, hey, you've got such a great, you've got a great business here. Why are you trying to grow it? Because you'll grow it right into that point, this no man's land point that you mentioned, Chuck, where now all of a sudden this isn't this comfortable, super manageable small business with tremendous cash flow. This is a, a it takes on a life of its own. And, 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 and really this exploration part of the planning process that we use and any good exit planner is going to use is really what is your primary objective, right? Exactly. And, 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 and that drives everything. And at the end of the day, your personal objectives, your personal goals should drive what you do with the business. And if it's the other way around, the business becomes the centerpiece and it drives it drives to a place where it wants to go. And most of the time, that's really not where the, the owner ultimately really wants to go. But no one has slowed them down, stepped them back and said, OK, yeah. is, is this right? Is this right for you, for your family? 
Yeah, I mean, sometimes we see it all the time. I mean, I say sometimes we see it all the time. That makes no sense. But, I mean, allow me. We see it very often that the business will take the owner where the business wants to go, not necessarily where the owner wants to go, right? We, we share the passion for small business owners. We share our personal convictions on the need for them to treat your business, treat their business as an asset, connect their business plan with their personal plan. You've had tremendous uh, business and professional success, uh, well-educated. What I want to uncover here is talk to us how Value Compass itself, the actual software, and what was the genesis behind that idea? Well, the, the, the genesis behind it goes way back to graduate school with the ability to, at the end of the day, measure the business as an engine. Because at the end of the day, people buy the future. They don't buy the past. And we bear, we as a, as a business community are really good about measuring the past. You know, finances are his, historical, right? So we have an accurate view of the, fu- of the past. What we didn't have was an accurate view of the future. How do you predict what's going to go on in the future and how do you impact that? And if you begin to think about the business as an engine, then you can begin begin to think about measuring the gears of that engine, where they're weak and where they're strong. And that would then give you the ability to have both an accurate backward-looking view in finance and an accurate forward-looking view with operations. So lots of research with top institutions in the world, thousands and thousands of hours, some of the best and the brightest. And basically what it comes down to is this. If you think about the business as an engine, inside are these 18 gears of operating performance. And what Value Compass does is measure those gears, whether they're weak or they're strong, both relative to as a as a well-run business and against peers within the industry. And the first step of Value Compass is to say, okay, your business is an asset. We can say this is what it's worth, but we also tell you what it could be worth. So let's say it's a it's a manufacturing business and it's worth three million dollars. But we also can tell you now that it could be worth five. And that's called the value gap between where it is and where it could be. But now that we measure the gap, we can tell you exactly what makes up that gap, what you need to do, which of those 18 drivers you need to work on, and the value of fixing a driver. So it's very, very quantitative. Mm -hmm. It's fast, takes about 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea was to enable professionals and business owners to work together and get their arms around the business as an asset and then begin to make good decisions. So that's why we built the first piece of Value Compass and the tool's called Discover. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So talk talk to us. You've got how many tools in that toolbox, Chuck? You've got how many stages that we look to share with our business owner clients? So we basically have four core tools. So the first one is Discover. 15 minutes to understand the business as an asset, you know, the gaps and and what can be done about it. And then there's a second tool called protect. And what that does is it connects the dots between that business as an asset and the personal plan. And it doesn't, again, it's it's a a tool and assessment takes 20, 30 minutes of conversation. But, you know, in, in a little over an hour, the business owner can have a complete view of their business as an asset, how it connects to them personally, so they can begin to make good decisions, which leads, you take all that data and leads to another tool called Roadmap. So you, the owner, have a place you want to go, where you, you have objectives, you have goals, and it turns all that analytical data into a roadmap. So, okay, helps you prioritize, what do I do now? So it becomes very, very clear. You're here today and you want to be over there in a six months, six years, whatever it is, it creates a roadmap. And that's sort of the third tool. And at that point in time, there's a lot of things that may or may not need to be done on the personal side. One of the things that we have found over the years is that one of the things that tends to keep business owners awake at night is is the lack of of insurance, believe it or not. They're worried about the future. They're worried about their families. They're worried about their their business, their community. And there's just this deep, deep worry that keeps them awake. And once you begin to use Mark's words to unpack it, and you say to them, okay, sort of what would make you feel better? And they say, mm-hmm. oh, they talk around it. But the bottom line, believe it or not, it's life insurance. We worked with hundreds and hundreds of companies. And nine times out of 10, the very first thing we got, we, we didn't sell life insurance, by the way. It's nothing that we did. But mm-hmm. what we found is if you put that in place, 
relatively quickly because it's relatively cheap. Mm. All of a sudden, the owner goes, oh, I protected my family. I protected my, my, my employees. I feel like I can breathe now and I can begin to go to work. So, and, and the numbers actually are pretty straightforward. Most business owners are underinsured by four or five hundred percent. It's four one or of the five hundred percent. Four or five hundred percent. Yeah, and this and is it, not a com- this is not a commercial for the life insurance folks, right? I mean, this no. is just facts. And I mean, we've seen it, it, it uh, and I, I've seen it in my travels. Is it really? It's it's discover where am I now, and where what could my business be worth? The second stage of that alignment with one's personal plan is I need to protect what I've already built, right? I need to shore up, protect my family, protect my key employees, make sure my key employees stay with me. So there's all sorts of planning options there, whether it's phantom stock or stock appreciation rights. I got to keep the band together, if you will, before we go out and start uh, heading into uncharted waters where things might get a little bit rocky before we arrive on that next beachhead. Exactly. And that, and that's what we found because the work that we did was growing companies. We were functionally, I came in as a chairman of the board. I've been chairman of 60 plus companies. You know, I've run hundreds. And what we found in the very beginning is once we understood the business as an asset, where it could go, what was possible, we'd time the owner out and say, time out. Until you have had a conversation about how it fits into your personal plan, we will we won't go any further. Mm-hmm. We always had a a timeout, and it was the best thing we ever did for owners. And they always said that to us. The most important thing we ever did was time them out and give them a chance to sort of go back and fix things. And nine times out of ten, the very first thing they did was put that they protected what they had, as Mark just said, because that's the best way of thinking about it, which set them up to decide on where they were going to go in the future. Yeah, I think that what what I've, you know, again, I keep going back to my travels, but I mean, it's, this is the business that we're in and we're, you know, we're, we're here to f- help other owners finish big, but part of finishing big, I think is starting correctly. Right. And you've built a biz, you, you've built a successful business. You've accomplished so much. There is that, that, that lack of firm footing, if you will, if you're not properly planned, whether it could be your estate plan, your personal financial plan, et cetera that really lessens the anxiety, let's put it that way, and allows you to think strategically about what's next in your business. And and our guest today has been Chuck Richards, CEO of Value Compass. Chuck is a good friend. He's got a great business, passionate about the small business community. Uh, Chuck, share with us maybe a couple of case studies, maybe a couple of before and afters, if you will. Uh, Maybe we've got time for one or two here of businesses that, maybe went through discover protect and uh, the next step and, and where they ended up and it, it, it may be the good and the bad. Got it. So I'll tell you my favorite one. So um, I, again, think of me as the growth consultant, the guy that's going to get the business all straight up to where it's supposed to be small manufacturing firm. I got called in by, I believe it was a spouse, but it could have been a be- one of the best friends um, met this gentleman and uh, he just had an offer for his business. It was an offer that, that he said it, it it fit what he thought he needed and where he wanted to go. And I said, great. So I said, what happened? He said, well, he told me the story. A lot of these perfect offers always have one hook. And he goes, here was the hook. Absolutely got my price, but I had to stay around for a year in order to make sure the business got where it needed to go. And he goes, I'm selling the business so I can leave. Hmm. And so we talked about it. I said two things. Number one is I will take on the assignment if and only if you have a conversation with somebody like Mark to make sure that if we do sell it at whatever price, you can actually accomplish your personal goals because you haven't done that, have you? He goes, no, I, I sort of think it's okay. I said, so that's job one. I said, job two is I will make sure the business is saleable. And so we, we shook on that and he, he met with somebody. Three months later, we had an offer on the table for twice his old offer. Wow. And, and he could leave. Why? Because we turned into the business like an asset. We made sure that he didn't have to be there, that somebody else can run it. He had bench strength, all the most basic things in the world. Here's uh, but, the funny part. Yeah, I mean, they're basic. They're basic to you as a graduate of MIT, my friend. But for many of the uh, the business owners that are out there toiling 
in their life's work, it, it, it becomes hard for us to see sometimes what's basic. You know, it's like playing golf. This is this show's being recorded just after the Masters, Chuck, as you know. And sometimes your can alignment, your alignment can be off, and you need your coach to say, You're aiming in the trees there, Mark. Maybe we should get it back on the fairway, right? And so uh sometimes things aren't as easy as they appear, depending yeah. on the lens you're looking through. Right. And and, and easy is the wrong, wrong word. Yeah. But it the when when it comes down to it, your coach is going to get you back to the basics. Mark, right. don't swing the club into the woods, right? right. Swing it down yeah. the fairway. That's why you have coaches and advisors and others. But what this gentleman did is he passed on the offer. Why? He said to me, you know, Chuck, I'm having fun. Yeah. I haven't had fun in my business in so long. And I said, okay, well, have fun in your business. Keep going. And I said, maybe on the side, you can try some of those things you've been thinking about because now you have more time. And that's what he did for a year. A year later, he sold the business for even more and went on to his, his new career, which was public speaking. He wanted to be a public speaker. That's the, what he wanted to do. And I met him a number of years later. He was a public speaker. He was happy. His financial plans had worked out as he accepted. But if he hadn't stepped back and had someone make sure that if indeed he is going to sell, he could sell for a price that makes sense and fits his plans, because if he had sold to that first buyer, it wasn't enough money. Yeah. He would have been in trouble twice. Yeah, yeah. Big takeaway for me here is treating your business like an asset, ladies and gentlemen, right? Do you treat your business like an asset? I know for many years I didn't treat my business like an asset, and I would say that it was the proverbial tail wagging the dog. And and now when you take a, take a step back and have a more strategic objectives, and to your point there, Chuck, building the elements into a good business, you can oftentimes get re-energized because life is better than it was before. And I'm not as stressed out and as anxious as I was about what's going to go wrong next, right? Because I've fixed things along the way. The value of a coach, the value of advisor, the value, I think, of a great tool like Value Compass to help you analyze your business, help you understand how to treat it like an asset. What are the attributes that make it worth more? what's holding you back and that alignment, that protection uh, mechanism, the alignment with your personal plan. Chuck, this has been great today. Uh, always great to reconnect with you. Yep. Thank uh, you for your time. Well, um, thank you. Thank you. So tell, tell our listeners, how can, uh, how can we sample value compass? Um, you know, this, this sounds a bit self-serving, but there's folks like Mark that have the tool because you need people who know how to not just use it, but how to have that conversation. The power of Discover as a, the first tool is to enable an advisor to have that first conversation about the business as a business, as an asset, so they can see the business through the same lens you, the owner, have. Yeah, and yeah. Getting you both on the stable to trust, that's the key. Yep. So I'll put a plug in for Value Compass. We've used it now for four to five years in our office. What I love about it is, A, it's comprehensive, it's holistic, but I can sit in a coffee shop and in 15 minutes with very little financial information, maybe sales, maybe earnings, give you a pretty good estimate on what your machine shop is worth or what your, uh, your garden store might be worth and really how it stacks up to some of the peers and where, if we were to work together, things you can focus your attention. So our guest today has been Chuck Richards, Chuck, CEO of Value Compass. Chuck, thank you so much. It's been great having you, and uh, we will look forward to seeing you down the road very soon. Thank you, Mark. As always, it's a pleasure. Great. Luck, thank everybody. you. This has been Mark Dorman, your host of the Finish Big podcast. Until we visit again, my friends, here's to Finishing Big. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed listening to Finish Big, the podcast with Mark Dorman from Legacy Business Advisors. Click the follow button to be notified when new episodes are available. Learn more at LegacyBusinessAdvisors.com or call 330-350-5410. Please be aware the information in these podcasts represent the views and opinions of our guests and do not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Legacy Business Advisors. The content is for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional tax or legal advice. Always seek the advice of your legal or tax professional with any questions regarding your specific situation.